parks are geographies of memory and delight, of connection and contemplation. They're places to play, to wander lost in thought, to explore. They provide a soul-satisfying refuge and bring us back to our humanity. A city park breaks the boundaries imposed by the urban environment, boundaries of race, class, neighborhood culture, the street grid, the avoidance of strangers. When we enter a park, we expand because parks are everyone's backyard and play space. When you go to the park, uh, you're not only all equal, uh, but you all share in the ownership of this space. Whatever um, your hardship in your community might be, uh, when you're sitting on a bench in Boston Common, um, it's your turf. Few urban spaces allow us to come into such easy contact with people from every background and neighborhood. Millions of people live in cities, and city parks are a vital and precious part of our lives. But they need care, and they need advocates. And they're not neighborhood parks, they're city parks. And I think that's a really important distinction. They bring people together from all over the city on a daily basis. This is the story of the Friends of the Public Garden, an organization that came into being to fight for the health and well-being of the historic parks in the heart of Boston, the Public Garden, the Boston Common, and Commonwealth Avenue Mall. From our 21st century seat, let's look at our three parks, rediscover their origins, and learn of the Friends' role in their modern history. The oldest park in the United States the 48-acre Boston Common was established by public subscription in 1634. The Puritans brought with them a desire for common land, primarily for pasture. Further uses mirror the history of the city and the nation, a site of execution and persecution. It also was a site integral to the American Revolution and the Civil War. An urbanized and prospering Boston of the 19th century converted pastoral uses to a place for organized public recreation landscaping, art, and celebration. The public garden was established by private subscription in 1838 as a botanic garden of 24 acres and was transferred to the city of Boston in 1853 to become the first public botanical garden in the country. The public garden is the groomed and formal cousin to the more raffish and exuberant Boston Common this is epitomized by the addition of the Swan Boats in 1877 by the Paget family, inspired by Wagner's Lohengrin. We have an enormously unique environment here. In fact, that is the magic of the experience of the Swan Boats. It's the environment in which this happens. We've always recognized that they were the centerpiece of the public garden and its greatest attraction. Specimen trees, ornamental and tropical plantings, and formal parterres are surrounded by residential architecture and create a noble yet ethereal intimacy. Boston's answer to the Champs-Élysées, the Commonwealth Avenue Mall provided the central boulevard to a neighborhood built on reclaimed and filled land over a 40-year period. Extraordinary prosperity and a burgeoning merchant and industrial class demanded an outward and physical reflection of its sophistication and urbanity. It was a main promenade for this very elegant neighborhood when it was first built. So there are pictures of ladies with parasols and baby carriages, and it was always used somewhat ceremoniously. But people use it in all kinds of ways, and over time it's changed. It remains one of the country's finest examples of 19th century architecture and planning. The upheavals of the 1960s took a heavy toll, playing out their alienating effects on the physical and social conditions in these public spaces. Vietnam, a growing counterculture and increasing drug use, an economic recession, lack of investment, and a growing suburban culture led to a low point in the condition of urban parks nationwide, and Boston's three historic parks were not spared. In 1970, the degraded conditions found in the public garden alarmed a small band of neighbors. Thus, the Friends was formed, initially to address the deplorable state of the garden. Later, their concerns expanded to the Common and Commonwealth Avenue Mall. In 1972, the Friends contributed $500 to combat the scourge of Dutch elm disease, which had just been discovered in the parks. 
when we first started to um, form the organization, over half the trees on the mall were either dead or dying. So there were blocks where there were maybe three or four trees. It was it just devastated this landscape because it was almost totally elm trees. The Park Plaza project became the mobilizing threat in 1971. It was urban demand on a gargantuan scale. Retail offices, hotel, and apartments in six buildings, 450 to 650 feet tall, with massive demolition of existing buildings. The project proposed for Boylston Street was to restart the construction industry and provide employment and private investment sorely needed in a recession-strapped Boston. We estimated um, that if you made a comparison, it was uh, the same as Mount Washington uh, next to Central Park. The Friends were in many ways defined by their nearly decade-long battle against Park Plaza, working with other community activists against enormous odds. The struggle cast a light on the problems and incredible values of the garden and common, which were threatened by this development with shadows, wind, and untenable levels of pedestrian traffic. The Park Plaza was a, a terrible threat to the parks, but it also did something uh, beneficial. It focused attention on the work of the Friends and the conditions of the park in a manner uh, that we never could have otherwise have achieved. It persuaded the city to set to work to begin uh, the restoration, first of the public garden and then of the common as well. This long and dramatic battle was a watershed in the public realm, establishing the principle of citizen participation in the planning of large urban renewal projects. Also a first was the need to prepare environmental impact statements to study the effect of wind, scale, shadow, and traffic generated by such development on neighborhoods and green spaces. The care of a park is constant, a continual and never-ending process. Every week, in every season, every year, there's work to be done. Our stewardship extends the city of Boston's capacity to do this vital work and to advocate for the parks. Our thousands of volunteer hours and expert care over the last four decades have pulled our historic parks in the heart of Boston back from the brink. We could not manage particularly these three parks to the level they are now without the help of the friends. They are really critical to us and um, they make all the difference, I think, in the level of care you see. The downtown core would not look like it looks today if it weren't for the Friends of the Public Garden. It just wouldn't. When parents come to view an institution of higher ed for their son or daughter, they know what their son and daughter may be interested in in their field of education, their field of interest and study. But most importantly to a parent is to see the environment in which their child will be living. And when you come around the bend, either down Tremont or up Boylston, there is no way that a parent can't appreciate the incredible work that's ongoing each and every day with the friends. I mean, it's no secret that the, the parks that have friends are the best maintained parks, you know? They're the best parks in the city. And it's because they're able to plug that gap between what the city is able to do and what the parks really need and deserve. I feel that I've seen enormous change. And I think that I've learned from the friends that it isn't simply about caring for a space, but it is creating a sustainable model for that space to be as beautiful as it potentially can be forever. I think the Friends of the Public Garden are really um, a model of how a public-private partnership works. Please keep going. The Parks Department um, needs you. Uh, we couldn't possibly continue without support like this. Congratulations to the friends and a big heartfelt thank you. And I wish ahead for many more decades working together to maintain and preserve what I personally think is the most beautiful part of Boston. A man who wrote a book about the common many years ago, Mark DeWolf Howe, uh, said at the end of his little book, a little history of the common, um, that whenever the common was threatened, um, there was always an army of citizens who would come to its rescue.
And I think there always will be such an army to care for these special historic green spaces 